All right, Shabbat Shalom, YouTube, Facebook. We're in uh, Genesis chapter 30, starting at verse 1. It says, when Rachel saw that she bore Yaakov no children, Rachel envied her sister. She said to Yaakov, give me children or else I will die. Okay, here we go with the more, more dysfunction, dysfunctional relationships here going on. Verse 2, Yaakov's anger burned against Rachel. And he said, am I in God's place who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? She said, Behold, my maid, Bilhah, go into her that she may bear on my knees, and I also may obtain children by her. Right. So, supposedly, I heard, because I was listening to a message on this chapter, that the term uh, bear children on my knees is an idiom of like an adoption i guess when somebody has children they put the baby on their knees it's like they're claiming the child is their own so that's kind of what's being said there i'm not sure i didn't look into it i didn't double check but you know it's a kind of weird phrase like where, where is this coming from you know behold my maid bill go into her that she may bear on my knees and i also may obtain children by her. So it's kind of like taking the rights of being the, the mother, even though she didn't uh, bear that child. Milo. Yeah, I did look it up like it is actually like, a, well, from what I found that it is a legal, sorry, a legal standing that the children of uh, Bilha would be looked as Rachel's children. Okay. Um, and, that, and henceforth why, she's, why she names the children. And you don't see so much in regards to was this Bill Hill? Yeah, Bill Hill was first. Yeah. Um, but I want to go back just a a, a little bit <clears throat> for those you know because it's 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 difficult. One, their their situation is extra crazy because now you have rivalry going on, right? Because there is multiple wives here. There's the sisters that are married to the one husband, and you know after I imagine being years, Leah has four sons. And Rachel is still barren. I mean, that's it's 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 hard enough for a woman to be barren, let alone when you have uh, some say sister wife. I'll just use that term, a sister wife who has given um, your husband four children and you have you have none. There, there's that whole big rivalry, and that's where we see that envy come up. But it's it goes to a different place when Rachel is coming to her husband and saying, "Give me children." Um, and not so much seeking Yahuwah in that and acting out in that anger. And I think that's why Yaakov responds the way he does and is angry and saying, am I basically, am I, am I God? Like, I'm not the one that opens or closes the womb. And that's something that we really, as women, especially when you're trying to conceive and, and, and going years or months, whatever it is, however long through that struggle, prayer and staying, like it is, very important to keep saying before you it's difficult i'm not gonna lie it's very difficult it's 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 can be depressing can be overwhelming even if you're even if you don't have sister wives and it's just you it's it's a very serious emotion that women go through um but we can't take our eyes off of yahuwah i think it would be different if we go to our husbands and say please be praying for me please be fasting for me like let's make sure we're on the same page and together in this. Um, <coughs> that that was just, um, that that was interesting within those, those few verses. Thank you for sharing. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Verse four. So Bilha, uh, Rachel gave him Bilha. So Rachel gave Yaakov Bilha her servant as a wife, and Yaakov went into her. Bilhah conceived and bore Yaakov a son. Rachel said, quote, God has judged me and has also heard my voice. 
and has given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan, just like Milo was saying. You don't see Bill her name in the children. It's Rachel doing it. All right, Dan, what does Dan mean? Yeah, Henry's. <laughs> somebody else. Come on, somebody jump in. Milo will take this whole thing. <laughs> She's ready. Has something to do with Judge, doesn't it? Okay. Cedric has his hand up the way. Yep. Hey, Judge. Cedric. I have a question. Um, okay, so just like how when we were reading last time about the uh, the older sister uh, being uh, having to marry first, like these are not these are not God's commands, right? Or Yahuwah's commands, right? These are just the customs of their time. What What you know, do like, you mean? You know, she said about the uh, you know bearing the child on um, on her knees, and because I guess my question, my real question is, is like. It never says, like, does Bilhah have a choice in this? Like, or because she's the servant, she just has to bear this baby and give it away. So I'm saying, like, is that just a custom of their time? Or are these things that... We don't yeah, have I guess any... That's just it. Yeah, but good question. We don't have mm -hmm. any evidence of Yahuwah giving precepts on how to go about this from Genesis chapter 1 till now. There's no evidence that there's any type of thundering on a cloud and tablets and you know books being written on you know so it's all going to be assumption here and i think it'll be a fair assumption to say yeah it's cultural um uh, because remember they abraham went to canaan with isaac and they're going back to where are they going back to um i'm going to say mesopotamia but there's another name for the land where they're going to to get the wives right because it's all about go and get wives from our our family our type of people right so it's um, her, 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 her right so um, chaldeans yeah the chaldees or whatever which is in mesopotamia which again i think if you look into this it's bab it's bab it's related to babylon it's babylonian it's a babylonian location okay but the promised land that they were promised was the land of canaan not babylon okay but they're going back to their families and what was going on in babylon religion wise i mean there's probably all kinds of gods that people worship up there so you know we don't know where these precepts come from but we do see later on, Yahuwah does give instructions through Moses on how to facilitate having multiple wives, how to treat them. So it's not that Yahuwah is against multiple wives. He's not, because he's already given his stamp of approval by giving instructions later on about it. But if we were just, if we didn't get there yet, if we, didn't, if we were people that were just reading the scriptures from beginning to end and like watching a movie, we have no idea where these precepts come from or where this culture where these you know so all this we're just taking it in because it's 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 the way that they lived it's a it's a cultural thing we saw abraham do it with sarah sarah had abraham go into her servant so it goes as far back you know as abraham probably further back than that um so that's a good question, but that's, that's the answer I would give. We don't have information to say for sure, where is this coming from? Is it coming from Yahuwah or is it coming from man? You know? So you can assume either way, but there's not really good evidence for that answer. Milo. Yeah, I think it's definitely um, on that cultural aspect because these were given as, as, right now, if you look at the woman wives, it just, it just means woman. Usually it's just like his woman, his wife, his lady. Um, so I think that's a good question. That's something definitely I want to look into between the concubine and, and her rights, like a servant, because she's still his wife. That's still his woman. Like no other man could take her. We're talking about Bilha and then um, yeah. his other his other wife, because mm -hmm. <clears throat> they are considered concubines later on. So it's it's like this interesting um, dynamic of a servant wife, which I have not looked into. Um, but I would definitely say cultural. I do know last week when, when uh, Ezzy had mentioned the, the only aspect that I can remember where a child is not considered yours 
that is from Yahuwah is later on the rights of redemption, which we had talked about last week. So for example, <laughs> if if my husband, like my husband, right, he has two other brothers, two older brothers. And if we did not have a child together, like, and he passed away, so we never had any children under underneath that in it, I will go to his brothers, by according to scripture, I'll go to his brothers and say, we need the, basically, the children that I bear from you, like, I think at least the firstborn, I don't know about every subsequent one, but at least the firstborn born is not considered his brothers, but considered daddy nails. Now in our culture, in America, it's like, no, his brothers would be the father. Like you, 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 that's just plain. But here you says, no, that first one, at least I don't, again, I don't know about the subsequent children um, or if they would have subsequent children would belong to daddy nail and those would be technically under his name. Um, so that I do know in regard to this with the the women taking over, that's a bit different. Mm-hmm. But what I do find it interesting though with that question, you made me think about Sarah because Sarah, even though she told Abraham go to um to Hagar and bear a child because you know I'll obtain children through her, she didn't see Ishmael as her own, which is very interesting. Um Quite frankly, when you know, once she had hers, I mean, there there was definitely contention there because we saw we saw later on that um, Hagar went uh, despising Sarah. Sarah treated her harshly and all these things. Hagar ran away, came back. So, but I found it interesting just between this dynamic and that dynamic that Sarah never took to Yishmael as what I would see here. Um, and again, that so that's just interesting. But going back to the question with the names, when I was reading something, and it was kind of interesting, they're talking about um, the way Leah named her children versus the way Rachel started naming her children. So I wanted to go to Leah's children real quick, the first four, um, and then Rachel. It just made me think, if I may. So Leah had four children, and I'm just going to run through them real quickly. She had Her first one was Reuben, which was um, means behold a son. Then she had uh, Simeon or Shimon, which was means heard. Then she had Levi, which means joined. And then she had Yehuda, which meant praise. And a lot of her namings were focused around her husband and Yahuwah hearing her prayers. Like um, the first one, like, behold, I've given my husband a son or Yahuwah has heard me. And then she named Simeon. And then, you know, not Levi, meaning joined. She was talking about being joined to her husband. And uh, Yehuda being praised. So a lot of it was focused on her husband and that dynamic. When Rachel begins to name her first through Bilha, Dan, which which Jeff is correct, it means judgment. It's more against her sister. Like he's judged between us and not so much the context of the husband, which is interesting. And, and we'll go through the next name. So I think it's an interesting dynamic, the way they name their children. And later on, we'll see how Leah backfires because Again, it's not like us where we just name our names to be pretty, you know, in America. It's, they had meaning as to what they were going through. So I just wanted to bring that up. Mm-hmm. Shabbat shalom, Chris. Shabbat shalom, Chris. Welcome. Good to have you. All right. We're in Genesis chapter 30, verse 6 now. Does anybody else have anything before we continue? All right, verse 6. So she names her uh, first child... Um, by Bilha, Dan, which means to judge. Verse seven, Bilha, Rachel's servant, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Rachel said, I have wrestled with my sister with mighty wrestlings and have prevailed. So she named him Naphtali, which means what? Milo. Wrestling. Wrestling. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> Somebody else will get the next one. Don't worry. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Wrestling. All right. Verse nine. That's not for read. What was that, Dira? Subdivision begins. Rachel says, and Rachel said, God has helped me. And I continue to whom my sister prevailed. She called his name. Neftali. Amen. So is there something say, different God there? Has helped me. Can you just talk a little louder? God has helped me. God has helped me. That, that was the difference. Okay. God has helped me, huh? 
I have wrestled with my sister in my wrestlings, and God has helped me. God has helped me, and I contended with my sister. Okay. Got you. So she's claiming favor from Yahuwah. All right, verse nine. Milo, is your hand still up or? Yeah, sorry. Just but just a point taken in regards to her set her naming the second um son of Bilha. And again, it's it's focusing on this contention between the sisters. Right. So yep. like if Naftali when Naftali grows up, why did I get my name? Because I was contending with my sister in regards like I'm just thinking about the whole picture of this mm-hmm. and that wrestling that she's that she's mentioning. Um which of course would be internal wrestling as well when you think about it. Like she's struggling conceiving. She's still to this point, six children later, has not bore her own from from her own womb. Just just take that in because that that is huge. You know what I'm saying? So Yeah. Verse nine. When Leah saw that she had finished bearing, she took Zilpha, her servant, and gave her to Yaakov as a wife. Zilpha, Leah's servant, bore Jacob a son. Leah said, how fortunate. I don't know if you guys have something different. And she named him God. Okay? We talked about this before. This is definitely God. That's how you pronounce it. Um, who wants to take a shot at what God means? Jeff. It means troop. Yep. A troop. Yep. Or it could also mean what? There's another definition there. And, and think about the, uh, Think about the verse, too, again, depending on your translation. I have in my web translation, it says, how fortunate. But in different translations, it says something different. One says it. What does yours say, Jeff? And which translation are you reading? I'm reading the web, by the way. So the web says, how fortunate, in verse 11. Who has something different? You're muted. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, she's reading one version next to me, and I'm reading a KJV next to her. And uh-huh. it says that, uh, oh, gosh, where'd it go? It says, and Leah said, a troop cometh, and she called his name God. So a troop cometh. That sounds different. Anybody got something else? Do you happily. Really? It is happily. She called his name God. Happily? Happily. Like happy. Happy, yep. Happily. She called his name God. Good luck. Did anyone read the what luck? Mine says what luck. So she named what, his name. What God. translation are you reading, Ezzy? This is Hallelujah Scriptures. Ah, okay. Mine says good fortune, and that's CJB. Yep. Pentateuch says good luck. Yeah, if you look at the definition, depending on what definition dictionary you're looking at, you're going to have two definitions. A troop, which is a military word, or for a uh, fortune, which is, I mean, if you think about it, fortune to some of us, it might sound pagan and sound bad, but fortune is just blessing. It's prosperity. It's you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's favor, if you want to say in a different way. So if you're thinking about what Milo's been saying so far, there's this contention going on between the two sisters and they're having kids. And a lot of the naming that Leah's had, like my wife said, right? Leah's been naming her kids based on her relationship with, with Yako, right? Rachel's starting to name her kids based on her relationship with her sister. So it's like, you know, she's wrestling with her sister. My sister's against me. I'm against her. God is judging me. Oh, look. So maybe now Leah's getting into it, you know, getting, she's like, okay, Rachel wants to get her servant, you know, to Yaakov. Then I'm getting my servant to Yaakov too. So my servant could bear. 
So it wouldn't make sense to me personally that this would be, it would be fortune. I think that would be, in my personal opinion, it would be fortune because it's like how fortunate, you know, how I'm, I'm, I'm still bearing, getting, giving my husband more children, you know? And uh, later on, we see how this word, God, is used by evil men and evil women to worship a deity that they worship. Not that the word itself is evil. Because if the word itself was evil, Yahuwah would come down, would send an, send an angel or send a prophet of some sort to say, you shall not be called God any longer. Your name shall now be. You know what I'm saying? If the word God was really that pagan and that forbidden, it, it would have been it would have been known by Yahuwah. So there's a lot of people out there, you know, people in our in our walk, Hebrew roots, you know, messianic, and they're sacred namers, sacred worders, I will call them, that they now forbid you to to, to pronounce the word God, even though we're in English. We're not in Hebrew. So when I say God in English, I'm not referring to, you know, fortune in Hebrew. I'm speaking a different language, you know, but people would like to connect the two because they, they like making connections. These, you know, sacred worders, they like to like puzzles, putting pieces together and just put things together and come up with a conclusion, even though that's not the way linguistics works. You know, who you condemn is the people that speak the Semitic language of Hebrew using the word God to worship a deity that they call God. See, they're, they're doing it in the same language, in Hebrew. Again, let's not forget, Abraham came from Ur, Mesopotamia, a.k.a. Babylon, and they're going back. They're, Abraham's children, Isaac, Yaakov, are going to Mesopotamia to get their wives. All right, these are, these are the people that we're dealing with. So. Later on, when you start seeing the word God being used to worship a different deity, don't be surprised because there were Semitic Hebrew-speaking people in Babylon and Mesopotamia. But that does not make the word evil. And here you see one of the children are named either Fortune or Troop, however you want to see it. I, I will go with Fortune. I think it's consistent. That's why it makes sense later on people are using that name fortune to worship a god of money or of some type of prosperity because that's a good word that goes with it anybody else got anything on that before we move forward all right verse 12 zilpha leah's servant bore Jacob a second son leah said happy am i were you reading verse 13 last time derail instead of 11 What's what's uh what's your verse thirteen say in the Septuagint? Uh, I am blessed. Okay. So so it was happy. Yep. Okay. Verse thirteen in the, in my translation says Leah said, "Happy am I, for the daughters will call me happy." She named him. Ashar, Ashar, however you want to pronounce it, Asher or Ashar. Uh, that's H836. Anybody want to take a shot at that, Milo? Means happy. Yes. Root word is almost exactly the same. Ashar means to go straight, walk, go on, advance, make progress, go straight, happy, blessed. All kinds of good stuff. All right, verse 14. Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Here we go. Two sisters going at it. Leah said to her, 
is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. I don't really know the significance of this. What I do know about mandrakes, I don't know what the connection is here. I really don't. But I do know that the, the, the fruit, mandrakes, is a romantic fruit that's used in the book of Song of Solomon as well. Um, you know, talking about intimacy between a husband and a wife. I don't know what the significance is, is here. What, you know, what, why does she want these mandrakes from the sun? I don't know if there's another cultural kind of, is there some kind of something she's taking from him that's more than just mandrakes? Is this like a rights kind of, is she trying to overstep boundaries of some sort? I'm not sure. I don't really know the answer to that. Milo. So I'm going to say, um, one, in the aspect of uh, being an aphrodisiac and, and two, in the sense of helping to conceive. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are natural things, um, plants, herbs, like maca root, things of that sort of nature that can start helping your hormones, helping conceive. Mm -hmm. so, um, some, some take on it is that the mandrakes was very huge because, again, Rachel hasn't conceived at this point uh, herself. Uh -huh. She's conceived through, she hasn't conceived, but her, her servant, her maid right. has but she herself hasn't. Mm -hmm. So now there's a huge contention between Leah is coming here and saying, well, I'm technically Yaakov's first wife. Like I, I, I was the one with him first. Right. Like technicality, right. And actually getting into the covenant, ma marrying, solidifying that. And so now, and we know that there's years here, a history of rivalry and contentiousness and all that between the sisters. And so now that, the firstborn Reuben comes with this, um, with the mandrakes and Rachel's asking for them is saying, I want to conceive. This is a, this is a, a, a huge take that many people have. I want to conceive. And so Lee's saying, um, hold on. First of all, you took my husband. I already know I have my four boys. I think at this point she has a few more. Um, Zopa already has some, Bill has some, and now you want to, now you want to, like, it's just, it's just all this buildup between the history, between the sisters and the story, and so this becomes now a barter. Fine, give me the mandrakes, take your alcove today. Like, this is how contentious it is. You can lay with, with my husband, your, our, our, our husband, you can lay with mm -hmm. him, but give me the mandrakes. Um, so that, that, I, I do, subscribe to that belief i do believe that it is something that was to help with the birthing process to help with the hormones to help with all that um, i like that i like that i, I like that idea yeah, but that's i can kind of see that so hence why in song of solomon it's used as something to eat before consummating and such raisins right they talk about raisins mandrakes and these are fruits that I, I, if you've done your research it does seem like it helps to reproduction and so forth. Um, what is it, uh, conceiving and whatnot. So yeah, interesting. I did hear, now I was listening to a message on this chapter today, and I, I, again, I can't verify any of this information, but I do wonder, again, of Rachel and Leah and Laban, right, the father, I, I wonder what is their spiritual state? Who do they worship? What God do they worship? I, I'm just, I, I, I become curious you know, because not everybody ended up like Abraham. Abraham was set apart. He decided to cross over and follow Yahuwah's calling, right? He went away from his family. We read about that in the New Testament. But like, what's, what's, the, what's the status, the, faith, uh, the religious, um, spiritual status of the rest of that lineage, that family that's over there in Ur, where they're going to get these wives? So I wonder, like, what is Leah and Rachel, is, are they carrying any of that still? Are they holding on to some maybe pagan ways? It's a question. I know that I was listening to a guy uh, preaching on this chapter, and he was saying that, you know, they believed in a lot of luck and a lot of different, you know, gods of this and gods of that. And uh, anyway, that would be an assumption. We can, later on, we'll probably see some more clarity on this. But it is something that I think about. Like, you know, where's their allegiance? Jeff. 
Um, I, I got, I have some, a cross reference for the name of GAD. Okay. And it's, it's to affirm which, which definition. Okay. Um, so here's, here's what I got. <clears throat> um, in Genesis 49, Jacob calls his sons to him and he begins to prophesy about their, their end. What will become of them? Right. 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 If you go down to 49 verse 19, he prophesies to Gad and it says a troop will overcome him, but in the end he will over it says Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. So it's it seems like maybe it's a prophetic name. Yeah. If you it go through the list, it's got all <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Does it say a troop will press on Gad? Um, it says in my in I'm just online right now, uh, and it just says uh, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. Yeah. So that's I mean, again like this is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make a big deal of it, but to me it sounds like it's not saying that Gad's a troop, but that even though Gad's not a troop, he's still gonna overcome a troop. Again, that would that would that would mean to me being fortunate. Or being blessed or being favored or, you know, it's almost like uh, David. David's not a big, strong guy, but he defeats Goliath with a stone and a slingshot. You know? Somebody sharing screen? What's going on here? Who's this? Oh, Christopher Mallet. <laughs> Christopher Mallet's experimenting. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's, that's what I would say to that. So it didn't say Gad was a troop, but that a troop would try to overcome him but gad would would uh over overcome the troop so but good find good find uh let's go back to chapter 30 milo go ahead um well let, well let's think of it in the, in this regards quantity a troop an army has a lot of people right and sure. we know leah j just a thought process leah has four and then her servant has two more children yep um so it could be in, in that regards as to quantity, like okay. in, in that sense, like I'm building a troop, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I got a little military. All right. Okay. Um, but the second part you, you asked in regards to the idols or asked in regards to their gods, I would say, yes, they were influenced at bare minimum, Rachel, because later on, I don't know the cross reference right now, but we know that later on when Yaakov wants to leave and he does wind up leaving with his wives and his children, Rachel takes an idol. Yes. And Laban, her That's father. what I was waiting for, but you jumped ahead and you shared it. But yeah, I, I got it. I got it. Like, you mentioned it, we might as well. I'm not gonna dive fully into it, but yes, I would. So I would say there is right. that, um, that tug between because you have to remember, uh, most, um, if not all, actually, of these of these pagan nations were polytheistic. Absolutely, so monotheism was not the even to this day. Monotheism is not the majority. Right. Like when they talk about monotheistic religions, you usually name top three and usually name Islam, uh, Christianity, and Judaism. Right. That's most religions are, you know, Hindu, like, Buddha. Exactly. Buddha, are polytheistic Buddha. and will add on gods. Yeah. Basically. So, okay, now I know your God is legitimate. Let me just add him and worship him um, and bring him into the fold of the many gods I already have. So I would say that's definitely something that was still a tug and you can see it within our excuse me within our history of israel what do they do they go back and forth between other gods um it is something that's within there a temptation idolatry is like one of the like the top sins um that our people wind up committing so i definitely would say that there is that influence in regards to um other deities and and, and the way they were raised and such agreed agreed that is definitely my my thought process as well. Anybody else? No. Nope. Jeff? Yes. Go ahead. This is a little tenuous, but my wife just looked up the Mandrake thing on Google. Uh huh. And there's a ton of pagan reference back to the Mandrakes and and there honoring the Mandrake in some way. I wonder if she was. Yeah, I wonder if Rachel was trying to tap into something. She was like, "All right, well, you know, I'm still not conceiving." Maybe it's not a health thing that she's doing to help on a natural health. Maybe it's some kind of luck thing that she's trying to conjure up some kind of, you know, know, thing so she can have a child. 
it, it's even in Harry Potter. It looks like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just Google, Google it. There's a ton of there's a ton of stuff about it, and um, but it's all these uh, you know, quote unquote, pagan sources. Yeah, I always thought it was referenced in uh, the story of um, Sleeping Beauty when the witch gives her the apple. I thought that was supposed to represent a mandrake. If you look up that, you know, Disney is very pagan, so. Yeah. So. Ten U.S. Maybe, maybe there's something there. Maybe Again, there's... yeah, no. All, all we could do is kind of like, you know, assume a little because it's not really given us the answer to this. But later on, like like my wife said, later on when when they do go away, Rachel's carrying an idol. She's stealing an idol, you know. So you can, uh, you, there's obviously some idolatry, pagan, polytheistic influence here in this family with Laban, Rachel. I believe so. I think it's in the family. I think it's in the culture. And Abraham is the one that stands out. He's worshiping a monotheistic, only God, you know, Yahuwah. He's passing this on to Isaac. He's passing this on to Yaakov, you know. Obviously, there's a lot of dysfunction going on in the beginning of all this. Can you imagine, guys? Like, this is, this is Israel. This is the beginnings of Israel. This is our forefathers. Everything doesn't seem so peachy keen and perfect, huh? It's a little dysfunctional. How Yahuwah works all things together for the good of those who love him, called according to his purpose. You see? See, that message is even all the way right here in the beginning. All right. Let's get back to this dysfunction relationship. Genesis 30, verse 17. So, God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Interesting. I'm going to read 16 and 17 again. Yaakov, oh, I didn't read 16. My bad. I didn't read 16. Here I go, 16. Yaakov came from the field in the evening, and Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lied with her that night. And then... And again, I'm, I'm looking at this, right? Because when I read 17, it said, God listened to Leah. I'm thinking like, where, where did the topic of God come from in the subject, you know? I'm thinking about the author of, the, of Genesis, which wasn't during this time. The author who wrote Genesis had to be, right? We discussed this before in previous chapters. There was evidence that the person writing here was writing retrospectively in the back. So here the, the narrator is saying, God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Okay. Leah said, God has given me my hire because I gave my servant to my husband. She named him Issachar. And if we look it up, Issachar is... H3485, there is recompense. There is recompense. Verse 19, Leah conceived again and bore a sixth son to Yaakov. Leah said, God has endowed me with a good dowry. Now my husband will live with me because I have borne him six sons. She named him Zebulun. Zebulun, H2074, which means exalted. I don't know if anybody has anything different than that. Habitation. Habitation, okay. Yeah, dwell with me, habitation. I like that one better, actually. Mine says dwelling. Dwelling, yep, dwelling, habitation. I like those better than exalted. Makes sense with what we were reading. You know, I try to go with what's being said here. Now my husband will live with me, right? When we talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, we talk about how it prophetically represents Yahuwah tabernacling with us, Yahuwah becoming man, right? Through Yahusha in flesh, dwelling amongst us. And then later on in the book of Revelation, a new heaven and a new earth, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It's a temple, and Yahuwah will dwell with us. We will dwell with him forever. 
verse 21. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and named her Dinah. Justice. Justice. Thank you. So we got one that's named Judge, which was what? Dan? Which one was it that was Judge in this chapter? I think it was Dan. Dan. Verse 6, right? That's correct. They're kinda, it's kind of related. They both start with D. One is Dan, one is Dinah. We got Justice and Judge, kind of related to each other. And we got two hands up. I'll go with um, Milo. I have that her name does mean uh, judgment. <clears throat> okay, interesting. Well, that, it's another, that is a, like the female version of judgment. Okay. Which I think is very interesting play between Dan and um, Dinah as well. Yep, yep, yep. Interesting. Uh, Ezzy and then Jeff. Did anyone bring up Deuteronomy 27, 11? No. Um, so just like we keep talking about this aspect of there being like contention between the sisters or um, there being like uh, this, this difference with the, the heart of Rachel and the heart of Leah, I thought it was interesting that in Deuteronomy 27, when um, the blessings and the curses are given to the nation of Israel, in verse 11, it says, And Moshe commanded the people on that day, saying, These are to stand on Mount Gerizim to Barak the people, bless the people, when you have passed over uh, the, the Jordan. Uh, Simeon and Levi and Yehuda and Issachar and Yosef and Benjamin. And these are uh, to stand on Mount Abel to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And if hmm. you look at the way in which they were conceived and the way in which they were named, I think Yahuwah is showing what the, the heart really looked like when they were being born. Because even, um, even Zebulun, the way that Leah named, because all of her children except for Zebulun are all standing on the blessed mountain. But Zebulun was like that retaliation baby to Rachel. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone else caught that. Good catch. No, I was I was not looking at that. That's a good that's a good catch. All right, um, Jeff. I was just gonna say the same thing about judgment that Dinah in mind means judgment. Interesting. All right, verse twenty two. Let's keep going. All right, now it says here, God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived, bore a son, and said, God has taken away my reproach. I just, I, I can't help but think about, I just, I just can't help think about how God is involved and what is the spiritual state of these women? I just, I just, I don't know, I'm just saying what's on my mind, okay? I, I don't know how to very verbalize it well, but it's something to the effect of, even if you're a sinner, God is still involved in your life in blessing you. When you get good things, right? Doesn't he say the he, Yahuwah, he reigns on the just and the unjust, right? So when you get good things, and I'm, I think I heard a friend, uh, Gina, Sister Gina, talks about this all the time. She talks about how even in our wandering state where we were off the path, there are moments, if you are able to recite and remember and look back, you can probably count how many times God has stepped into your life to help you with something, and you never recognized it as being him that was helping you. Even as a sinner, I think that's fascinating. And I wonder if that's kind of what's going on. Like, I, I don't know. Have we read where Rachel and Leah make an allegiance to Yahuwah, the God of Abraham? I mean, have, did I miss that or did we never really read that? I don't think I ever really read that. I read that Yaakov's looking for wives and he comes and he wants to get some wives. And Yaakov should be serving the, the one and only true God, right? But where is, where is the state of these women, you know? And I, I just see God involved, like he's hearing their cry and he's 
allowing them to conceive, which is a blessing from Yahuwah. It's a blessing from God. God gives life. You know, I just, I don't know. My mind just, every time I read a verse that says, God remembered Rachel, I'm like, <laughs> his mercy. I'm just thinking about his mercy, his grace. You know, in the midst of all this bitterness, contention, hatred, um, you know, God is hearing. <laughs> I just, I don't know, man. I just, I just found that it just sticks out to me. Every time I read it, I just I have to stop. Jeff. Okay, I'm going to take this all the way forward to 1 Corinthians 7.14. Oh, yeah. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through the wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Mm. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. Mm. Thank, you, is, Thank, you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I was, I was thinking, thinking about thing. that, too. That was in the back of my mind. I was thinking about because of Yaakov. I was thinking because of Yaakov. There's some favor here. I was thinking of that too. Can't have Israel be unclean children. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be really awkward if both Jacob and all of them were all pagans. You know what I mean? Like, is this the beginning of, right? But then you At got least, to pull clean out of the unclean. At yeah. That point. They had to start clean. Yeah. It starts with Abraham, right? Or it starts with Noah and then Shem, Abraham, Isaac. Yaakov, we have the ones that are called out, separated, you know? But yeah, all right, I like that. Good connection. Sanctified, the wife is sanctified through the believing husband, or vice versa, according to Paul. You know, the husband could be sanctified through the believing wife. Now, I never believed that that was talking about them being saved. I do believe, yeah, yeah, I saw your hand up, Amani, and I, I, I do my whole Christian life, you know, that was kind of like the belief, right? That the, but that doesn't make any sense. Like I believe every individual is responsible for their own salvation, but there is this element of, there's some kind of spiritual reality to having a believing husband in the midst of having an unbelieving spouse. There's something, there's something there, you know, and we can see it right here in Genesis. I think we see evidence for what Paul is saying. Right here in Genesis, Jacob is a believer. Rachel and Leah are questionable. We don't know where they're at. I mean, we kind of read ahead and saw that Rachel's still keeping idols. But in the midst of this, in the midst of their spiritual, poor spiritual state, Yahuwah is involved in blessing them and being gracious and merciful to them. Perhaps that has to do with what Paul is saying in that Corinthians passage. Thank you, Jeff. That's good. Milo, and then Ezzy. And there's, I'm going to read from um, <clears throat> Genesis 26, <clears throat> verse. This is talking to, to Yisak, right? So we know that Abraham had the covenant, it goes down to Yisak. I'm just going to take, take one of them. In verse 3, it says, Sojourn in this land, I'll be with you and bless you for unto you and to your seed. I will give all these countries, I'll perform the oath which I swore unto Abraham your father, I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto your seed all these countries, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, and did guard my watch, my covenant, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah, and then it gets passed down to Yaakov. There's also this aspect of, yes, I agree, when you first ask the question, my thing is, he reigns on the just and the unjust alike, um, at the same time, Yahuwah is very covenantal, and we mention that all the time. Yeah. And it's something to not forget that yeah. he has a running covenant going mm -hmm. through Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, that will be passed down to his children. And this is the birth of our nation, Yisrael, mm -hmm. like you had said, as, as contentious as it is, as, as crazy as it is, messy as it is, it is the birth of what's going to be our, our nation and the 12 tribes of Yisrael, and it's going to set a whole precedent. So the, there's still this covenant that's running down. Um, and we just can't forget, man is flesh. We, we wrestle against our flesh. We wrestle against our spirit. So even if we look at, the, you know, the great patriarchs, they were still, you know, areas where they had to, to deal with sin and areas that they had to have um, received mercy and grace from Yahuwah themselves, as well as the women, obviously. So I just, 
in my mind, I'm still thinking there's this covenant that is running down that's being passed down. Um, could you who have just used one wife and, and still had 12 tribes? Of course. Yeah. He's in control of it all anyway. Um, so there's more. He's, he's definitely always looking into the situations for sure. I do believe he's, he's hearing them because they're still praying. And, you know, like I, 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 part of me thinks about those who come into the faith. I'm just taking this completely now, not even back then. Come into the faith from idolatry and having to be stripped away, right? Slowly but surely, having to get away from these things. I mean, there's times in the scripture where even I think Yahusha, not talking about the Messiah, um, has to say, put up, put away your idols. Like it's continuous throughout throughout generations. Put away your idols. Cleanse yourself. Go yeah. be sanctified. That this has to happen. It is still this process of sanctification is not something that it makes me think of the process of sanctification. It's yeah. not overnight. Um, especially like you mentioned, when you're, when you're brought up in a culture, when you're brought up being polytheistic and things of that nature. Um, and when you're dealing with your own sin, rivalry and contentious and maliciousness. So, but Yahuwah does remember, and, and I know that he has his covenant standing and he's going to keep to his promise for Abraham's sake, which is very interesting. Uh, so that was just my, my thoughts in regards to that. Amen. As he, and then, uh, Chris. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of piggyback off of what, what Milo is saying and, and, and what everyone has brought out about, you know, carrying on this covenant through Abraham, um, it reminds me of the scripture in Matthew where Yahushua was sitting with the tax collectors in um, Matthew 9. It says, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his Talmudim, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Yahushua hearing this said to them, those who are strong have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And you have all of this dysfunction and contention going on, which is also exemplary of why, you know, the law of Moses is there on, on how to dwell with wives and how to do certain things. If we didn't have this example of what not to do, you know, there wouldn't be, maybe there wouldn't be a need for Yahushua to come. I mean, if you're already righteous and you're already doing everything right, and if everyone is as righteous as Abraham, I mean, what, what more... I don't know. I just think that it's it's needed. It's needed to see because we are human. We are. We do have carnal. We are um, warring against the flesh. But I just think it's amazing how through all of that dysfunction, those are the tribes. Those. That's what we're born from. That's what we come from. And through all that dysfunction, there's still blessing. Prayers are still being heard, and people are still being delivered. You know, there's there's still a a a lineage or a legacy that goes back to Abraham, even through all the dysfunction. And Yahushua said himself that he's not there for the strong, or he's not there for those that are already righteous, but those who need a physician. And it just shows how much how much Israel needed that physician and needed the law of Moses, so that we don't keep, you know, straying away and doing these things. I just think it's beautiful. And he still, through all of these children, he still shows even now different things that we can learn from and, and what to do and what not to do. So I just, it just made me think of Matthew. Amen. Amen. Chris. I have a question. Um, not a comment. My question is um, you had mentioned your Darren L you had mentioned you wanted to understand that the, um, just the spiritual state of Jacob's wives. Um, if you don't mind just commenting on Jacob's, uh, Yaakov's spiritual state, even as we examine the wife's spiritual state. So if you, if you don't mind, if you could just comment on Genesis 28, 18, and give me your perspective on that, then that would, that would help me um, also put in perspective Jacob's spiritual maturity or his level of faith when it came to uh, trusting Yahuwah. Yep. You said Genesis 28, 18? Yes. All right. It says, Yaakov rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on its top. 19. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. So he called okay. that place a uh, house of El, house yeah. of God. And then verse, you can just, you can conclude at verse 22, yeah. that'd be good. All right. Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace and Yahuwah will be my God. 
Then this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, will be God's house. Of all that you will give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Yeah, I think he has definitely an allegiance to Yahuwah, although imperfect, being that his exit from his father's house was deceiving his own father, lying, um, taking matters into his own hands, although it was prophesied that he would be the one that would have the blessing and the firstborn rights. He followed his mother's instructions to deceive his father, which is breaking uh, later on one of the Ten Commandments, which is to honor your father and your mother. It was dishonoring to uh, Isaac for Ye Jacob to lie to him and say he was someone that he was not. Um, so I think his exit was a, you know, he left his home with a little deception, but he did have a type of an allegiance to Yahuwah. You know, so although his allegiance was to Yahuwah, he was definitely imperfect in his walk. And I think this experience by slaving and working for his wives through Laban hopefully humbled him because he was getting a taste of his own medicine of being a little sideswipe, deceived, thinking that he was going to get Rachel first. But actually he worked, what, 10 years and got in the middle of the night. You know, father sends the, the wife in covered. It's probably dark. Wakes up in the morning. This is not the wife that I worked 10 years for. I think Jacob got a little taste of his own medicine, but hopefully he's being humbled. And, uh, you know, we, we will see later Jacob obviously get stronger in his faith. But I think in this younger stage of his, he's definitely, he's not perfect. But at least he has an allegiance which I don't think, I don't know where Leah and Rachel stand with this. I've never seen something like this. You know, him making an allegiance, making a pillar, making a vow, you know, uh, to the God of Abraham. That's yeah, the, re the reason why I was asking, because in verse 21, it says something interesting. Um, my translation says, if I return to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. It's like then, like if, if this happens, then it was like, I'm just trying to understand his level of trust yeah. and the, you know, the Elohim of Abraham. I'm trying to understand where is he at in his faith. And now he's yeah, I don't have then, I have and, so it's a different translation. And many times just that one word could definitely change the way you look at the verse. But mine has, so that I come again to my father's house. It's not an if, it's a for sure I will. Um, father's house in peace and Yahuwah will be my God. Mm. So it's like, he's still going to be with me. He's with me now. He's always been with me. He's been with me since I was born. He's never left me kind of thing. That's how I would take it. But either way though, I think in his, like I was saying in his young stage, I think he was lacking a lot of wisdom and imperfect in his walk. Yet I think he did have an allegiance you know, at least some kind of allegiance to Yahuwah surface level, which I think we can all admit that we've all had. I think our beginnings to our walk was an allegiance of some sort, although we were imperfect in our walk, right? And I think, you know, it took us time to grow and get to where we are today and still grow. Jeff, that's good though, Chris. Thank you for bringing me here to this verse. But even underlining all of that, there was still a promise made to Abraham. Right? Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. one way or another, it had to go this way. But I, I never realized it until right now that exactly what Jacob did, he had a fast one pulled on him in the exact same manner in the middle of the night, covered up, pretending to be somebody else. Uh, I just caught that when you guys mentioned it. That's really great. That's kind of like Cain and Abel and, and, you know, the payback that they kind of received because of the, the losing a, a kid. Man, that's that's, no, I don't take credit for that. That was brought up in our study. Somebody, I forgot who, but somebody in this group brought it up. So I don't take credit for that. That was actually somebody in the group. And I was like, ooh, I like that idea. That sounds, that makes sense to me. You reap what you sow, you know? Um, Milo. I go back to Brother Chris's question. I think that's good because I'm going to read one small thing that we haven't gotten to yet, but <laughs> you, um, Yaakov acknowledges Yahuwah or the Elohim of, of his father like in verse um, 30 it's going to come up where he says Yahuwah bless me even Laban recognizes it and the next chapter 
when he is going to wind up heading on the run. I'm trying not to get too many details, but I know you don't like that. Yeah, I'm going to end this recording with verse 24. So you can say what you want to say, but we're going to do a separate recording for the next session. Okay, cool beans. Um, but in the next chapter, you know, Yaakov in verse five, he says how the Elohim of my father has been with me. So he's still, it's still like a, recon, a recognition. Yeah. Recognition, yeah. Of this is, you know, what's happening. Or later on, we find out that he's still getting dreams from Yahuwah. Yeah. Um, in verse 11 of the next chapter as well. So Yahuwah is still intervening directly to, directly with him. Yeah. Um, and that covenant is very, very important. That, that pillar, because he is going to go back to it. So it's very, very important. Um, yeah, very, very important. That's all. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to end with verse 24, okay? <clears throat> it says, so she named him, and who are we talking about here? We're still talking about Rachel, right? God remember Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. Hallelujah. Verse 22, God opened the womb of Rachel, okay? Verse 23, she conceived, bore a son, and she said, God has taken away my reproach. And then verse 24, she named him Yosef, okay, which means Amen. may he add, okay, saying, may Yahuwah add another son to me. Uh, so sticking on the subject, uh, you know, again, I just, I find it fascinating, Yahuwah's intervention it obviously has a lot to do with Yaakov, has a lot to do, I think I, I agree with what was said here today. It has a lot to do with the covenant Yahuwah made with Abraham, passing through Isaac and Yaakov. Yahuwah is a covenant God. He does not change his covenants. And that's what people need to understand. Christians need to understand that. When you're talking about the new covenant, it's really a renewed covenant. Yahuwah is not changing what he said he was going to do in the past. A covenant that was previously established doesn't get revoked. Okay? So Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 33, it says a new covenant he's going to establish with the house of Israel and the house of Yahuda, the house of Judah. It doesn't say he's making a new covenant with Christianity. Okay, Gentiles, non-Israelites need to convert to Israel, to being an Israelite, to serving the God of Israel, to serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Okay, not the other way around. It's not that... Israelites need to convert to Christianity, all right? That's wrong. That's not the covenant God we serve. That's a different covenant. That's a different God, okay? Um, but I do want to, so that's on that note, Yahuwah's mercy. We've seen his mercy all throughout this chapter so far. I think that's something to recognize, his grace, his mercy, his sovereignty, that he's in control, right? He's in control. His hand is in everything, Um but I do want to mention, this is a side note. I know people disagree with me. Don't get upset about this. We don't, we don't we're not the debate on this. But I, I find it interesting, this verse 24. Uh, she names him Yosef. And then it says, may Yahuwah, according to the Masoretic text, they have the name Yahuwah in there. Okay? May Yahuwah add to me another son. If you look up the word Yosef, depending on, I was looking it up just a few seconds ago before we read this. And Yosef is H3130, okay? Now, this is a Strong's Concordance. A Strong's Concordance is a Christian concordance, okay? I'm just going to be honest. And it says Jehovah has added or Yahuwah has added, right? But when I look at the spelling of Yosef, I don't see a Y in the H. I don't see Yah in his name. I see Y. I see... Uh, um, a wav, and then the shin of some sort, right? And uh, and I don't know, I'm losing the letters here, but there's definitely not a Y and the H there. There's not a yod and a hey. So it's more correctly when I read it earlier through this, um, the app's little note they had here, it says, may he add. So it's more correctly, may he add. It's not may Yahuwah add, because Yah's name's not in Yosef. And... The reason why I went to that is because in Exodus, remember how we read in Exodus where Yahuwah tells Moses um, he did not reveal his name to Abraham or anybody before until then. So they didn't really, in my personal opinion, I share this, I share this often, in my personal opinion, I don't believe they were calling upon the name of Yahuwah. They were calling upon the name of El Shaddai or God. It was very 
very more basic. And I think that would have made more sense in the chapter. But I know the author, whoever the author is, whether it's the author doing Moses' time or whether it's some, some Masoretic text Israelite person that rewrote the Old Testament, they put the Tetragrammaton, they put Yahuwah's name in here. It causes a little confusion. You know, some people are like, oh, wow, they knew the name. And then we read in Exodus, no, they didn't know the name. So um, I just wanted to make that little, that little note there. I think the narrator, the author, is obviously crediting the God, Yahuwah, to all of this. And rightfully so, because it is Yahuwah doing it. But I don't think that's, that's originally what uh, Rachel was saying. I, I believe it would have been more, she was basically just saying, God has added to me another son. Anyway, that's just a small little note, nothing really deep, but um, every, the, the main message was just honoring, recognizing Yahuwah's covenant, his mercy, his sovereignty, his control, um, his mercy and grace in the midst of, of uh, our immaturity um, or, or even before our uh, state of being believers trying to see, you know, if, if you're watching this video, I highly doubt it, but if you're not a believer and you're watching this video, or if you know somebody, you are a believer and you know somebody who's not a believer, I would challenge us to try to point, challenge the person to point at blessings and things that have happened in that person's life that could be credited to, to God being merciful and gracious in their life. And if he's been so gracious to you, you know, why, why not? Why not plead your allegiance to him? Why not surrender your life to him? You know, hasn't he begun? Hasn't he been good to you? You know, kind of a kind of a thought process. So that was a thought inspired by a friend of mine. You know, Gina and Marcus. They talk about this subject a lot. You know, Yahoo is mercy. Yahoo being in their lives, always being in their lives. You know, and I get it. I get it. I understood, um, and I understand now. Uh, so anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the study. Uh, join us on the next one. We'll continue from verse. 25 and on on the next one. But this was Genesis chapter 30, verses 1 to 24. Shalom.